We're going to study the book of Ruth and see and see what qualifies a person to be a redeemer. A redeemer is someone who is it's someone who can free you from a debt that we owe. It's a debt we can't pay, and we need a redeemer. So spiritually, we know what what it is, because we owe the debt for Romans six twenty three for the wages of sin is death. So we had death coming our way, because we couldn't pay the wages of of sin. So what did the Lord have to do? He had to send His Son Jesus, since we couldn't pay this debt. And Genesis one twenty eight. So I'm going to show the spiritual side. In Genesis 1.28, God gave Adam dominion over the earth to rule it. And then in Genesis 2.17, but uh, God tells Adam, tells Adam, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou, that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And that's when Satan came into the garden and defeated Adam and Eve, his wife, Giving, giving them the fruit to eat. Now, Eve is the one that accepted it. And then Eve gave it to Adam. And Adam ate. But the devil deceived Eve, not Adam. Okay? So, because they ate of that fruit, that was, that's where sin came about. Our, the first sin that man did was that. So, since Adam became a sinner, now... And have him be in the dominion over the earth, ruler over the earth. And since Adam is the one, I mean, uh, Satan is the one who defeated him, that made Satan ruler of the earth now. Because when a king, well, I hate to call him a king, but when someone defeats another person, then that person is over them. Right? So Adam lost what he had, now Satan has it. And we find that in Ephesians 2 2. Where it says, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience. So Satan is the prince and power of the air. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So the devil took Jesus up on a mountain, and showed him the kingdoms of the world. And Satan said to Jesus, I will give you. So who did they belong to? Satan. If Satan said, I can give you this, apparently they belong to the devil, right? Yeah. So as we can see, the devil became the king of this world. And our God, being a just God, he was a just God. When Satan defeated Adam, he could have just destroyed Adam and the devil. God can do anything, right? He can do anything he wants. Just like he created them, he could destroy them. But being we have a just God, he said, okay, devil, Satan, since you defeated a man, Adam, I'm going to have a man defeat you, which we're going to see that that was Jesus. And Jesus had to be a man, 100% man. Okay, since that's who Satan defeated was 100% man, well, then it was going to have to take 100% man to defeat the devil. And Jesus was that man. In John twelve twenty seven, now is my soul troubled. So Jesus had a soul. John thirteen twenty one, he was troubled in spirit. So Jesus had a spirit. John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. So Jesus had feelings just like we do. John nineteen thirty four, pierced his side and blood flowed out. So he had blood just like we have blood. Luke twenty two forty four, he was so burdened that he sweat drops of blood. So he could get stressed out just like we get stressed out. Jesus was 100% man. And that's what it was going to have to take to defeat the devil. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we couldn't get redeemed with silver or gold. They, we couldn't buy our redemption. Okay, It had to be through the blood of Christ, of this man. And because God said in Galatians 4, 5, that's not on there, you might want to write that down. 
In Galatians 4, 5, he says that we needed a redeemer. Also in Titus 2, 14, Jesus said that he had to give his life so we could be redeemed. So we needed a redeemer. Titus 2, 14. So, for Jesus to be able to, to pay the debt that we owed, that we couldn't pay, that, mean, that means he had to be free from sin himself, right? He couldn't have no sin. Because if he had sin, someone had to pay for his sin. But, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He knew no sin. Hebrews 4.15 says he was without sin. 1 Peter 2.22 says, Who did no sin? So Jesus didn't owe a sin debt like we do. So he could pay for it. He could pay for it because he didn't know that. Romans 5.19 For as by one man's disobedience, which was Adam, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Jesus. So by one man's sin, we became sinners. And so by one man's right, uh, obedience, we're going to be righteous. We can be made righteous. And the book of Ruth will explain what it says in Ephesians. So we're going to read Ephesians. This is, this is what the lesson really is. It, but it's going to take the book of Ruth to explain what we're about to read. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You know, submission in the Bible, it's a beautiful word. Some of us don't take it that way. When we submit to the Lord, nothing could be more perfect when we're in submission submission to the Lord. Men and women, husband and wives. Okay? Now right here we're talking about wives being submissive to your husbands. Submission is when you obey. Submission is when you obey with gladness in your heart. That's what submission is. You hear me? That's being submissive. Obeying without submission is doing, is doing what you're told, but you're doing it with bitterness. You're not, you don't like it. So both of them, you're doing it, but submission is when you do it with gladness. Obeying, just obeying is you're doing it, but you don't like it. But the Lord said, hey, I want wives to submit. It's a big difference there. Submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Now, I've said this before. If I see a wife not submitting to her husband, then I already know she's not walking with the Lord. Because this is what it says, right? I mean, I'm reading the Word of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So the way you submit to Him, that's the way you submit to the Lord. So that's why I'm saying, if you don't submit to your husband, then you're already disobeying God. So that means you're not walking with Him either. You're not submitting to Him either. I'm sorry, but it doesn't say to submit to me to to submit to him if he earns it. it doesn't say that. It doesn't say submit to him if he's good to you. It doesn't say that. It just says, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. That's it. He didn't put if this or if that. He just said, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Period. That was it. Women who work. They don't have a problem with submitting. Women who work, they don't have a problem submitting. A woman who works, when she goes to work and that boss tells her, I want you to do this or do that, she does it, right? Now, we have women in here who work. Tell me if I'm wrong. Are you going to tell your boss, uh, no, I don't feel like doing that today. Or I don't want to do that. No, because you know what's going to happen. So wives, women, you know how to submit. Especially if you're a working woman, you know how to submit. Yeah, well, you know how to obey. You, you do know how to listen to a man when he's over you. I mean, what is better? To submit to a man that's probably lost or to submit to a man who loves you and is a Christian? Which one would you rather submit to? That's a question for y'all. Hopefully y'all got the right answer. It's hard. I know it's hard for women to submit to their husbands. Okay, I know it is. Only if you're not walking in the Spirit. 
If you're walking in the Spirit, if you're walking with the Lord, it is not hard to submit to your husbands. Now the husband, now the Lord does say, husbands, love your wives. You know, sometimes it's kind of hard to love your wife. But the Lord didn't say, love your wife if this or if that. The Lord had to tell us to love y'all. Right? I didn't put that verse down here because that's not what we're on. But the but it does say it. Husbands, love your wives. So same thing with us. We, we There's times it has to be walking in the Spirit for us to love you. I mean, you know. <laughs> but it's But we can do it. Y'all can do it. We can both do it as long as we're walking in the Spirit. Do you, can y'all hear what I'm saying? If you're walking in the Spirit... You can submit to your husband with gladness. Not just submit to him and making a face and gritting your teeth like, ugh. I mean with gladness. I'm talking about if you're walking in the Spirit, you can do it with gladness in your heart. Amen? Seriously. We're Christians in here. I'm not talking to lost people. I'm talking to women who have the Holy Spirit in them. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, and you're using the Holy Spirit, you're using the power of the Holy Spirit, then you can submit to your husband. And not only submit to him, but you can submit to him with gladness. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Just as Jesus is the head of the church and he gave his blood so the church and Jesus can be one, just like he Jesus did that, the same with the husbands and wives. They had... They had blood when, when they became husband and wives. Now, I know today, I've, I've, I've taught this before, the woman has a thing called a hymen in her, and the first time she has intercourse with a man, she bleeds in this stuff. And it's the only time. It's the only time. And that with God, that's a blood covenant. Just like he made a blood covenant with the church, he's made a blood covenant between man and woman. So, just like... Jesus is the head of the church and he gave his blood. That's the way husband is over his wife because she gave her blood for us, for men and women to be be one, husband and wives to be one. Jesus is the head of the church, the body. And the body is the bride. And the husband is the head of the wife, the body, which it says right here, the body. And she's the bride. It doesn't say that the, that the woman is the savior of her own body. Because right here, at the end of verse 23, it says, And he, talking about the husband, and he is the savior of the body. Whose body? The wife's body. It didn't say the woman is the savior of her own body, like I said. It says the man, the husband, is the savior of the body, of his wife's body. Not her spiritual body, not her soul, her body. And the Lord never had women to be independent. There's nowhere in the Bible where you're going to find where women were independent. Now this is not going to be a popular preaching, teaching. Women don't like that. Women like being independent. They like saying, I don't need a man. But the women who say that are women who are lost or Christian women who are not walking with the Lord. But if you read the Bible from front to back, you'll see where the Lord always had the man over the woman. Because he likes man more? No. That's just the way he made it. The world, if you look at the world, you're going to get in trouble. I mean, how many women, especially uh, Hollywood stars, how many women are having babies without husbands? Adopting babies or whatever. The Lord didn't mean it that way. He meant for a husband and a wife to get together and have babies. It's a sin for a woman just to go and get pregnant. And it happens. Uh, I want to get pregnant, but I don't want to get married. This is the world. We need, to, we need to learn how to separate the world from our Christian life. We need to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now this is God's chain of command. This is what he this is this is scriptures right here. This is God's chain of command. This is his divine order. This is the way he wants it. Like I said, a woman being independent is not in the Bible. This is God's way. When when women try to run the home, 
they're breaking the chain of command. Because God says right here, and the man is over the woman. So when the woman is trying to be the boss in the house, now she's, she's sinning. She's sinning by breaking this chain of command that the Lord has right here in 1 Corinthians. Head means to provide. Doesn't men, it don't mean boss. Head of the house means that you're the provider, you take care of, and you lead spiritually. That's what being the head is. And I hate to say this, I'm sorry to say this, but most, most, not all, but most Christian men do not want this responsibility. They give it to the wife. I've seen it over and over. They give it to the wife because they want... They don't want to go to church on Sunday. They'd rather go out fishing or deer hunting, whatever season it is. Oh, you take the kids to church. So a lot of times the wife has to take the responsibility that should be the husband's. Y'all hear me? A lot of times. So men, whoever's listening to this, we have a responsibility. We're the head of the house, so that means we're a spiritual head also. Spiritually, we lead our wives and our children to the Lord. Not the wife. We do. And in verse 23, when he says that the husband is the savior of the body, we need to see what exactly what that means. When, we, when, when, you, when you read this verse the first time, whenever that was, and you read that, shouldn't, shouldn't have that put some kind of question in your head, in your mind? And the husband is the savior of the body. Did any of y'all go, oh, I know what that means. Uh, people read that and they just keep reading. Like I said, when you read the Bible, you need to study the Bible, not just read it. If you read the Bible like just reading a book, you're gonna miss you're gonna miss practically everything that the Lord is trying to teach. But when you read the Bible, you need to study the Bible. And when I'm reading the Bible and I'm reading verses, if I come across something that's well, wait a minute, what's that mean? Then I have to start meditating, okay. I've read over here or I read over there. I try to start putting things together and see what, if that's what he means. But when he says that the man, that the husband is the savior of the wife's body, does anybody in here knows what that means? Because we're getting ready to find out. And it's going to be, the Lord took the whole book of Ruth to explain that one little verse right there. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Now I want to start by showing you that men, men are supposed to work. This is biblical. How many of us want to hear the word of God? How many? One? Oh, I you were <laughs> so, no, that's a question. How many of us want to hear the word of God? Two out of three? I guess that's not bad. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I, 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 you got to show me. You got to show me. I asked the question, how many, and I didn't say don't raise a hand, because sometimes I say don't raise your hand. But right now I'm asking, how many of us want to hear the Word of God? Because this is going to be it right here. Genesis. Women, a lot of women aren't going to like this, but Christian women, you shouldn't have a problem with this. Genesis 3. I'm going to read verses 17 and 23. Now he's talking, he get. When Adam and Eve sinned in the, in the garden and God came and he gave punishment to Eve, he gave punishment to Adam and he gave punishment to the devil. But to the, to, to the man, verse 17, unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, not the devil. It doesn't say Adam listened to the devil, did it? He said, Adam, because you listened to your wife, and how Zedon of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. And so shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So cursed. First he had dominion over it. Now the ground is cursed. And in verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So did he say, Eve, you need to go till the ground? He's talking to Adam. He said, Adam, now you're going to have to work for a living. So the question is, who does God want to work? Man. He didn't put, say, he didn't say Adam and Eve. He just said man here. He's talking to Adam. 
so is the men who are supposed to work. The Lord has never meant for the women to take care of themselves. You're not going to find it in the Bible. And if there, whoever's listening to this CD, if you can show me the Bible where women are independent or they had to work to take care of themselves, then call me because my number's on the CD. This is not God's way. Women that are in the flesh, in the flesh, like I said, they don't like this. The Lord gives the responsibility. This is the responsibility of the woman. This is the responsibility of the wife. Titus chapter 2 verse 1 through 5. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. This is sound doctrine. Okay, the Lord, he started off saying, this is sound doctrine. That the aged women, that the aged men be sober, sorry, uh, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. Verse 3, the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, which means, you know, you live in, in honor of the Lord, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teacher, teachers of good things. Verse 4, that they may teach the young women. So who are women supposed to teach? Yeah. Women. Are they supposed to teach men? The qualifications for a woman, for, for a preacher, for being a pastor, is in Timothy and is addressed to a man. So women who are poor pastors, I wouldn't go listen to them because they're disobeying the scriptures already by becoming pastors. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. What it's saying here, don't disobey the word of God by disobeying your husband. That's what it's saying. Because if you do, you're showing that the word uh, that the word of God doesn't mean much. That's what it means by that the word of God be not blasphemed. Keepers at the home. That's what he's now. This is what the Lord is saying. This is the scriptures. This is what God has for women. Keepers at the home. And in Genesis, when he says, "Woman, your punishment is you're going to have children, and you're going to have pain when you have children." So we're gonna. So women, you're supposed to have children, and you're supposed to be keepers of the home. Nowhere does it say in here you have to go till the ground. That you have to work for a living. Doesn't say that. Genesis two eighteen, and the Lord God said, "It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him." Does that word say mate? M a t e. Or is, it, or is it M-E-E-T? It says meat. Women, wives, the Lord said you're here to meet our needs. Now, if anybody's starting to get a little upset because of the, of the scriptures, don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger here. Women who are in the flesh, they're not going to like what I'm doing, what I'm reading. Women, you're here to meet, meet the needs of your husband. Keepers of the home have babies and to meet the needs of your husband. You got teachers and preachers. They don't say that he made you a helpmate for us. The word is not mate. Mate and meat is two different things. Right here, the word is meat. You get the King James Bible, it's M E E T. Now, the devil has given women many reasons. He's given women many reasons why they, have, why they need to go out, get an education, so they can find a job. And they say, just in case my husband dies, you know, I should have this education or I should have this job. That's from the devil. That's from the devil. Because the Lord, he's going to tell us what we need to do, what women need to do if the husband does die. All right? That's what Ruth is going to teach us. So if the husband does die, we're going to read and see in the book, of, the, of Ruth, that it's a love story. How the Lord's plan tells us how to take care of women, widows, and His way. How many of us know that His way is better? How many of us know that? His, God's way is better than ours. Women, God's way is better than yours. 
If you if you listen, obey the word, his ways are better. We'll find that the book of Ruth, that there's three things you have to be to be a redeemer. You gotta be a near kinsman, you have to be able, and you have to be willing. Willing, that's very important. You have to be these three things in order to be a redeemer. This is the same three things <clears throat> Jesus had to do, had to have to, to be able to redeem us. Jesus had to become human, to become our kinsman. And when you give your life to him, what happens? God becomes your father, right? Which is Jesus. He had to be sinless, like I said before. So he was able, because he was sinless. Like I said, if he had a sin, then he couldn't pay our debt. But he was able, because he didn't have no sin. And willing, Jesus was willing to come. God didn't make his son come down here and down the cross. He didn't make him do it. Jesus did this willingly. Now these are three things that you have to have to be a redeemer. And I've showed you spiritually. <clears throat> now before we get started, let me show you uh, what it says in Leviticus. So you can, so you can understand the beginning. In Leviticus, Leviticus 26. It says, speak about the Lord, telling Israel that if they obey His words, that He would bless them abundantly. And He says, but if they're disobedient to Him, He would not bless them. And one of the ways He would chastise them would be through a famine. So ver uh, the verses in chapter 26 says, obey the Lord and He'll bless you abundantly. But disobey Him. And he will chastise us. And one of the way he chastises us is through famine. Now, wouldn't we rather walk with the Lord and be blessed? Oh, yeah. Yes, that's what I would rather. I'd rather obey him and be blessed and disobey him. And what happens when he dis we disobey him? He's, he spanks us. The Lord spanks us. He does. I've been spanked more than once. But praise God. Amen. Praise God that He loves me enough to spank me. When your parents, when you were living with your parents, did they spank you? Yes. They spanked you because they loved you. They didn't want you getting in trouble or whatever. They spanked you for a reason. Now in the book of Ruth, Ruth is us, the Christians. Boaz, there's a Boaz in the book. When we start reading about Boaz, he's like God. So as I go through this teaching... Ruth is us, Boaz is the Lord. Remember that. Now, now the book of Ruth is going to teach us what? How is the husband the savior of the wife's body? That's what we need to learn. So, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man <coughs> of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Verse 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech. And the, and the name Elimelech means my God, my king. That's what his name means. And the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons was Mylon and Shilion, they were of Bethlehem, Ju Judah, and they came into a country of Moab and continued there. Now that famine that was in the land of Israel was because at that time, if you read further back like in Judges, it shows where Israel was rebelling against God. So they were being disobedient, right? And Leviticus say, when you're disobedient, what happens? The Lord spanks you. So this is the way the Lord spanked them. He, may, he had a famine in the land. And Elimelech, the head of the house, the husband, then trust God to see him through it. You know, when the Lord spanks you, yeah, he's spanking you, but he's going to be right there with you. And then after the spanking, what happens? Things get better, right? Well, Elimelech didn't wait for that. He didn't want to go through this spanking. Now, that's what he should have done. But instead, he left with his wife and his two sons. And he fleed from the Lord's chastisement he trusts the Lord with his soul he trusts the Lord with his soul and his, and his eternal life but he couldn't trust him 
through this famine. And we're that way today. We're that way today. We can trust the Lord with our soul, with our, t- our eternal life, right? Those of us who are Christians, we trust the Lord that we're going to heaven when we die. That we're not going. That we're not going to. We're not going to be dead and just go into the ground. We trust Him that He is going to save our soul, and we're going to be in heaven with Him forever. We we believe that. We trust Him in Him on that. But we take little things, and since I, and since women, I was talking about y'all. Submit to your husbands. Oh. I don't know, Lord. I I have a better way. I'm serious. We always think we have a better way than God. We can trust Him with our lives, with our souls, but on some things that we read in the Bible, we're like, mm, I got a better way. And then what happens? We get in trouble. Right? Well, that's what happened to him here. He didn't trust God to see him through the famine. And we're going to see it cost him dearly. They fled to Moab. Now Moab was a city of sin. Moabs were very, they were very dark colored people. And it was a nation of heathens. They were all lost. Moabs were lost people. They had other gods. And this is where he took his wife and his two sons. Now he's the head of the house, right? He took his wife and his two sons to a lost nation. They stayed there about 10 years. And in verse 3, And the Lamech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now Lamech died. He was the head of the house, and he took his family in the wrong direction. Now you're going to go like, And God killed him for that? Acts Five verses one through ten. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sophia his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price. His wife also being pr- private to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now let me just say this real quick before I continue. This was their money. And it was time to bring the money in for tithing. This was tithing. And they didn't want to tithe all of it. So the husband and the wife got together and say, Well, let's just tell them that we made this much. So that way we can only have to, we only have to tithe this much. So they got together to lie about what they made. So this is what's happening. Verse 4. While it remaineth... Was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young man arose, bruned him up, and carried him out, and buried him. What happened to him? For what? For lying to the Holy Spirit. For lying to God. That's what they said. Verse 7. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter's answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she dead straightway on his, at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young man came in, and found her dead, and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. So, this husband and the wife agreed to lie to the Lord. And what happened to him? Now this husband up here, Disobeyed God, fled from Him, and the Lord did what? Our God is a loving, is a very loving God. He's a very loving God. To even give us a chance of salvation, to even think of giving salvation to us, was loving. But we read this like things like this. He's also a very serious God. Y'all hear me? You don't play with the Lord. 
So sometimes when you decide, I don't want to obey you no more, you could be going home. And these are the scriptures. Am I saying anything here that's what I'm telling you what I think? Everything I'm showing you is in the Word of God. Everything I'm giving you right now is coming from the Bible. This is not from Jesse. You won't play around and disobey the Lord? Take a chance. I mean, we have this man right here. The Lord took him home. because He led his wife and his children in the wrong direction. This husband and wife got together and lied to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit. And look what happened to them. We love the Lord with all our heart. But we also need to fear Him when we're being disobedient. I hope y'all heard that. Now at this time, Naomi, she was able to depend on her two sons to take care of her. Because that's biblical. Especially the firstborn. When the husband dies, it's biblical. This is the teaching of the Lord. When the husband dies, it's the sons who are supposed to take care of their mother. And the firstborn son, he gets the blessing. Meaning, he gets half of whatever the father had. Okay, just like Jacob. His name was later called Israel. Well, anyway, he had 12 sons. Now, when he died, the oldest son got half of everything. The other 11 split the other half. But the, the, the firstborn son gets half. No matter how many sons there is, the firstborn... This is biblical. This is Bible. If I need to teach it one day, I will. But the firstborn son gets half of whatever the father owns because... It's his responsibility to take care of his mother. Women, do you hear that? First you're under your your father. First you're under your father. Your father takes care of you until you marry. Not until you turn 18 and then you're on your own. That's not in the Bible. Fathers take care of their daughters until they get married. Until there is another man to be over them. To take care of them. Then he says... Okay, then if your, if your husband dies, then your sons take care of you. And we're about to learn, we're about to learn, if you don't have any sons or if your sons die, then who takes care of you? This is what we're going to learn. But y'all see, you, can you understand so far? Yeah. Women, the Lord always had protection over you. Always, he was always there to take care of you. You just need to listen to him. You just need to obey him. Verse 4, And they took them wives, the sons, and they took them wives of women of Moab. The name of the one was Arpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Now the two sons married Moab women. And what did I say the Moabs were? They were lost people. That was a lost heathen nation. And they married lost women. Which goes against the command of God. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, it says that we shouldn't be unequally yoked. And it's not talking about color. A Christian should not marry a non Christian. James 4, verse 4. Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? So if you're a Christian and you marry someone who's of the world, they're an enemy. They're an enemy of God. So right here, the Lord, there's verses in the Bible that shows, hey, lost people, I mean, Christians have no business whatsoever marrying lost, someone who's lost. Which, the example I've given you before, my wife, she, didn't, she was not a born-again Christian. But I really liked her. And I told her, I said, we couldn't get together Unless she got born again. So I showed her the plan of salvation. Showed her the scriptures. And she accepted the Lord. Praise God. Now I was able to marry her. Amen? Amen. She might not say amen. But I'm saying amen. (laughs) But this is true. I mean that's what the Bible says. So that's what I had to do. I like this girl. But I can't be with her. Because she's not born again. So the best thing to do is. Give her the plan of salvation. And and hope and pray that she would accept the the Lord. And she did. So now I was able to be with her. So I lived it. If I read it, then I live it. Right. Amen? Yeah. And, that's, <laughs> and that's the way we should be. When we read the Bible, we don't just read it. 
we live it. All right? And verse 5, And the two sons died also, both of them. And the women was left of her two sons and her husband. These two sons died also for the same reason the father did. The father disobeyed the Lord and left and went to a lost nation. Took his family. So the Lord took him home. These two sons, they married two lost women. So the same thing that happened to the father is the same thing that happened to these two sons. Now, what is she going to do now? Now she's lost her husband and now she's lost her two sons. And she's a foreigner in the land. She's an Israelite. She's not a Moab, Moabitess. All right? So she's in a foreign land. And their ways are not the ways of the Lord. So she's, she's like the prodigal son, Naomi. And what did she do? I mean, she, well, her husband let her out into the world. She was out there. She lost everything, just like the prodigal son. What did he have to end up doing? Eating with the pigs. But Naomi was like, okay, what am I going to do? She's out there in a lost land. Now she's going to have to depend on God. She's going to have to depend on God. And sometimes our lives, we go, uh, we put ourselves in the same place. We go on our own. Well, I think this is better. I know the Bible says this, but I really think this is better. And then when you done messed it up, and you're going to mess it up, your ways is not better than God's ways. So when you mess up, what do you got to do? You got to come back home to daddy. You got to come back to the Lord. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. Now Israel, Israel repented. As a nation, they repented. Okay? There was revival in the land. Israel, as a nation, they repented and there was a revival in the land. So Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws left to return to Israel. Okay, that's what it says right here. So, you know, like, if Elimelech would have stayed there with his wife and his two sons and just went through the spanking that the Lord had to give them, what would have happened? They would have been in this rival, revival and the Lord would have continued taking care of them. But they didn't do what the Lord said to do. Verse 7, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Now Naomi repents, and she goes back to the Lord. She, she's over there, and she knows she needs to repent and go back to the Lord. And that's how we, we need to learn how to do that. When we see we've done wrong, we need to repent. Some of us are just plain old hard-headed. We don't want anyone to repent. Well, well, they shouldn't have did this or they or whatever. And we're like, we try to justify what we did. But when the Lord shows you, hey, you were wrong, get on your knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. But believe it or not, some people have a hard time doing that. They have a hard time repenting. Verse 8, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord dealt kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. She thanks him for being good to her sons, and says to her daughter-in-laws to feel free to return to their house. And she says, Because the Lord has dealt, dealt with her by, by her husband and her two sons. Notice that she's, she's, she calls them good girls. These are lost people. But she said they're good girls. They were good to her sons. They were good people. But they were lost. How do we have that today? Do we have that today? Good people. We look at them. Oh, that must be a Christian. No. You can be good. You can be morally good. But if you don't have the Lord Jesus in your heart, you're lost. He's calling these, she is calling these lost girls right here. They're, she's calling them good. But we know they're lost because of where they're from. 
Verse 9. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they left and they lifted up their voice and wept. She says, May the Lord bless you to find husbands in your own land. Stay with your own people. This is what Naomi is telling her. And they wept. In verse 10, And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. So they're saying, We're going to go with you, Naomi. So what they, what they were doing here, they saw something in Naomi, okay? We want to go with you. I mean, she's telling them to go back home. But they saw something in Naomi. What do you think they saw in Naomi? Even though Naomi was like out of the will of God, but they saw something in Naomi. They saw the goodness in Naomi. Just like she saw in them, they saw goodness in Naomi. And she, and, and she wanted them to stay with her family. That's what Naomi wanted. In verse 11, And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb? that they may be your husbands. Naomi tells them to turn back home, that there's no more sons in her room for them to go marry. Now this is what she's telling them. Verse 12, Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons. Verse 13, Would you tarry for them till they grow old? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. <clears throat> Here we have a Christian woman who is trying to turn her daughter-in-laws from going with her. Because she's going back to the Lord. These women are lost. Okay? And she's trying to... She's going back to the Lord. These women... They've had other gods. I mean, they're from a lost nation. This nation had gods. And she's telling me, hey, you need to go back home because where I'm going, you know, I'm going to go serve the Lord, the Lord Jehovah. <clears throat> and she tells them yet another time, go back home. She said, the Lord has dealt harsh with me for letting my sons, for letting my sons marry lost women. And I don't want this harm you any more than what it has because they lost their husbands right so I don't want this to harm you any more than what it has so she's telling them to go back home Naomi is doing what it says in Luke this is what Naomi's doing in Luke 14 28 for which of you intending to build a tower sit it down first and count up the cost where he has sufficient to finish it you've got plans to build a house this is what it's saying you've got plans to build a house but you, you, this house is going to cost you a hundred thousand, but you only got fifty thousand. Um, but you plan? Did you plan that? You know, it's saying right here. Have you counted the cost? What is it going to cost to build this house? Do you have enough money? That's, that's an example of what this is saying. And then in Matthew twenty, Matthew sixteen twenty five, this is the cost. One of the costs. Matthew sixteen twenty five for whoever. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Naomi wasn't making it easy for him, like some of these preachers. We go witness to people. We make it real easy. Oh, get born again. You know, in fact, you got preachers who say, oh, get born again and you can have whatever you want. Ask and you shall receive. I mean, that's how they witness. How many of us know that that's not true? I mean, did John the Baptist get what he wanted? No. Did he live in luxury and have everything he wanted? And this was a, this was a man of God. King David. Most, most of his life, he was running from a king who was trying to kill him. And King David was what? A man after God's own heart. Was there pleasure there? No. We got preachers who preach that. Oh, become a Christian and you can... Uh-uh. You need to tell them, hey... This is what it's going to cost if you want to be a preacher. I mean, a, a Christian. It's not a bed of roses like a lot of people. When they're witness, they make it seem like it's a bed of roses. You, we need to, when we witness to people, we need to tell them, okay, when you become a Christian, you got to give up your life. you got to lose your life. You can't just say, yes, I want to be a Christian, and that's it. No, right here it says you have to lose your life if you want to save it. And that's what we have to tell people. 
Hey, you need to lose your life if you want to get born again. We need to tell them there's a cost. Verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Arthur kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth cleaved unto her. Now, Arthur wasn't ready to pay the cost. She wasn't ready to pay the cost. She knew Naomi was going back to her God. She had her gods over here. She wasn't ready to give up her gods to go live for the God that Naomi had. But Ruth, but Ruth, it was different. Verse 15, And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. She couldn't give up her gods for the God. Y'all hear me? How many of us have gods down here? Don't you know that there's times when money is your God? People live for money. Possessions, people live for possessions. This is, there's many kind of small G's gods in our lives. And right here, she wasn't ready to give up her gods. to go live for God. But Ruth, like I said, Ruth was different. Naomi tells her, go back, go back. She was making sure that she really wanted to follow Naomi. She kept telling her, go back, go back. But Naomi was making sure this is what Ruth wanted to do. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord... Now, apparently that's the way it seemed to Arpha. If it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. So Arpha did that. She wanted to serve the small g gods in her country. That's what she decided. That's what she chose, and that's what she chose. Whether the gods which your <clears throat> whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Arpha didn't want to do that. And this, was, this is what Naomi was going to. She said, as far as me and my house, we're going to serve our God, Jehovah. Now Ruth, Ruth, like I said again, Ruth was different. Verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Amen? Amen. Ruth was converted. She had been converted because of the life of Naomi. Ruth counted the cost and accepted it. She knew she was going to have to leave her gods. And not only her gods, but her family. Ruth knew she was going to have to leave that if she wanted to go with Naomi and, and live for her God. Ruth was willing to count the cost. Naomi said to her in verse 8, Return to your family. But she didn't. In Luke 14, 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. This is what the Lord is saying. This is one of the costs. Now, it doesn't mean hate like we know the word hate. It doesn't mean It's not saying we need to hate our father and our mother. We know that's not what it means. It's using that word, but that's not the, what the word means. <clears throat> it means don't put them before him. If you're going to put your father, mother, sisters, whatever, if you're going to put your life before God, then it says right here, you can't be my disciple. So God is saying, I am number one. If you're not willing to pay that cost, make me number one in your life. Put your father, your mother, your sisters, your brothers, your friends, your life second. Then he says, you can't be my disciple. Is that a cost? Do we tell people that when we're witnessing to them? We need to. There's a cost to being a Christian. Amen? There's a cost. We can't make it sound like it's all a bed of roses. Oh, everything's going to be good for you now and it's gonna, nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. We can't do that. But people do that just so they can say, Oh, I got what's, what's so-and-so saved. Like they did something. 
And a lot of times, that's why you have people who walked out, they get baptized, and not long later, uh, they're right back into the world again. Because they didn't know the cost they were going to have to pay. Verse 17. Where thou, where thou diest, I will die. And there would I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught put death port thee in me. King James is hard to understand. Some, some of these verses I ought to read out of the Living Bible. In verse 18. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So when Naomi saw that Ruth was very serious, Ruth was very serious when she says, Where you go, I'll go. Where you live, I'll live. Where you die, I'll die. And your God will be my God. Ruth is very serious about giving her life to the Lord. And when, she, when Naomi saw that, she said, now, now this is my sister. I'm no longer her mother-in-law. She's no longer my sister-in-law. I mean, they are. But in spirit, now they're sisters. And she said, now that she saw that, she says, now I don't have to say anything else. So, we have people who are Arpha. We have people who are Ruth. Arpha didn't want to pay the cost. Ruth did. Arpha didn't want to leave her gods, whatever they may be. Her family. Ruth did. But now, but now we've learned, okay, she's lost her husband and she's lost her two sons. Now she's going back to Israel. And they live by the way of the Lord over there. Israel lives by the way of the Lord. So now she's going back to Israel. Now we're going to see what happens.